Peace over anger. Honor over hate. Strength over fear. Twelve-year-old Obi-Wan Kenobi desperately wants to be a Jedi Knight. After years at the Jedi Temple, he knows the power of the lightsaber and the Force. But he cannot control his own anger and fear. Because of this, the Jedi Master, Qui-Gon Jinn, will not take him on as a Padawan apprentice. Now Obi-Wan is about to have his first encounter with true evil. He must face off against unexpected enemies and face up to his own dark wishes. Only then can his education as a Jedi truly begin. Younglings, and welcome to Padawan Library, the podcast where two people pushing 30 discuss Star Wars Junior novels. I'm Levi Peretic, and to my right, of course, I have my co host, Tim May. Yes, that's me, Tim May. <laughs> Hello, I am uh, <laughs> I'm an old man, and I like to read children's novels. <laughs> <laughs> I shouldn't say that I am a reading novice. I just started reading uh, regularly uh, not too long ago, so it's this will true. be... Uh... It's true. Levi is one of my most illiterate friends, <laughs> and uh, I'm very proud of him. He started to read in the last couple months, so we decided to start this podcast that's mm-hmm. all about reading. Of course, only sure. licensed material. We do not read books we don't read literature on this podcast we read (laughs) star wars licensed material and specifically that is written for people ages 7 to 11 (laughs) (laughs) well i mean let's be honest that's the age star wars is actually for well that's true that's true so um anyway uh to get started before we get started i just let's lay out what kinds of books we will be reading on the show like more specifically Today, as you can see from the episode title, we're starting with the first Jedi Apprentice book. Um, but there's so that's the kind of book we're reading, like chapter books, basically. So Jedi Apprentice, Jedi Quest, Last of the Jedi, yes. Boba Fett, Galaxy of Fear. Eventually, we'll tackle the Glove of Darth Vader. All that yes. fun stuff. Um, Junior Jedi Knights, of course, and that's all legend stuff. But we'll also be covering new canon stuff. Uh, there's, there's not as, there, there haven't been as many series, but there's, uh, I think there's something about, like, uh, Join the Resistance or something about young pilots. Mm-hmm. Or so stuff like that. We're going to cover all of it. Um, it's going to, you know, th- there's so many of these that we could do this podcast forever. I guess that's the idea. Yeah. <laughs> um, Just got to keep it going. Yeah, we did, this is our last chance at, uh, doing anything, uh, that anybody cares about, probably. So, <laughs> I feel like otherwise we might as well just die. You know, our lives yeah, are exactly. over; they're what, complete. What's the point? Well, well, it's 2019. It's the 20th anniversary of *Phantom Menace*. We were eight when the movie came out, exactly. And now we are now we're 28. So it's like, what's the point of even living? Uh, I mean, uh, childhood is 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 getting further and further away from us each day. It's true. Uh, so- I I think. There's uh, that's an important thing you mentioned. That's the 20th anniversary of Phantom Menace, and that we were eight years old when Phantom Menace came out. We are part of kind of the very last, the very youngest people that kind of became Star Wars fans prior to the Phantom Menace. I would mm-hmm. say, like, we became Star Wars fans around the mid to late 90s. Uh, yeah. largely centered around the special edition release was, yeah. was the, the formative experience for us. Aimed for us. Yeah. That's, so, uh, 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 you know, and we have our problems with the special editions like anyone, you know, although not necessarily the same problems as a lot of people have. Uh, but we can get into that over the course of this long 
illustrious podcast we're about to begin. Uh, but it, as a way to kind of uh, have people get to know us and what kind of Star Wars fans we are, we're just going to rank the movies. And uh, uh, are, you, are, are you excited to do this? I am excited to do this. I feel like if it, by our rankings alone, people have a general idea of who we are as Star Wars fans. So I want to say I this will... a couple things before we begin. Okay. We're going to count okay. down from 11. We're counting the Clone Wars movie, and we're, but, but uh, we'll get into all of that. However, uh, these are all the movies that have been released up through, it is now January of 2019. So uh, if you're listening to this far in the future... We will not be including episode nine. We won't be including, you know, whatever the Game of Thrones idiots are doing. Like I, I, I don't know what they're doing. I don't know what's happening. Uh, so the last film released in our time, in this moment, was Solo: A Star Wars Story, and so that will be included in our list somewhere. Um, uh, so, uh, and I will say that generally speaking, we're pretty uh, positive Star Wars fans. I would say we like all the movies to one degree or another. I would, or, is that right? Yes, yes, I love them all. So there's not one that I dislike, and that's what makes ranking them so hard. Like it, it is very hard. But ha- yeah, continue. Oh well, I just had I just sat here. I I wrote all the titles out, and then I just sat for a good twenty minutes trying to like figure out the proper ranking for them. So uh, yeah. we'll get into that. It's so. gonna like this will change tomorrow. If we had recorded this episode next week, uh, I might have a fairly different ranking some of it's pretty solid but um i will also say that at least i am very much a star wars originalist i count the six uh films in the saga that were overseen by george lucas much more heavily that doesn't mean that all six of them are ranked above all the other movies that they've made since right but it does mean that if i were to have to pick if i had to only pick six movies I would pick those six movies. I would I, I would forego everything else, even though I've enjoyed all the movies to one degree or another. And some of them are I agree. quote unquote better movies than some of the Lucas movies. And 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 when ranking these, I really like thought, well, should I rank the first six above all the other ones and make them the first six? But then it was like, okay, maybe I should like uh, tackle this where it's like let's focus on them as as movies as as. Uh, as in in the as movies standalone movies and uh, the content of those movies and how well those movies are made, so I tried to be critical. I think that's important because we uh, that that would just be kind of presenting what our general philosophy is about Star Wars. It would not be giving any indication about what our taste in extra film Star Wars stuff is, which is ultimately what this podcast is about. It's about it's about these junior novels that are not written by George Lucas, are not overseen, really, by George Lucas. So that if people want an idea of what we're going to think of the stuff we cover on this show, then we can't just have, you know, the six Lucas movies and then everything else the, w- the way that maybe we would do that if it was just a private conversation between the two of us. So let's get started. Uh, I agree. What's your I'm number not- 11? Levi. I think we should... Oh, number 11? I thought we were oh. starting with number 1. Are we starting with number 1? I think, I think we should start with number 1 because I feel like it's going... Because we're going to agree on number 1, probably. Okay. And our first three, I feel like we're going to agree on. But the later ones is where we're going to have disagreements. That's true. So It'll be should, fun. Let's, let's start so, with number 1. I, what is your number let's 1? Do, I'm A New Hope. That is also my number 1. I had a feeling. This is pretty simple to me. It's just the best movie. And people... There's another film that we will be talking about very shortly that most a lot of people have at number one. Uh, that I'm sorry is just not a better movie. It's it's a maybe a more it's it's a more it's a slicker movie, but it's not a better movie. And our number two is what Empire Strikes Back. I Empire, okay, of course. Okay. Empire. So let's just bring it out in the open. Two for both of us is Empire. It's an incredible movie, but I think it's a slicker movie. It is not a better movie. Star Wars. Uh, The original film has just a a kind of handmade quality that I find endearing. I just find I think the care I like that the three main characters are together through through much of the action of the movie. At that, it's I mean you get a little bit in another film that we'll talk about. 
<laughs> but you don't really get that otherwise. You know, in Empire, they're separated the whole time, and I, and that's right. that works for that movie. But in terms of just what I like in Star Wars, it's kind of just the camaraderie and the and, and just and I just think the filmmaking is more interesting. The editing by you know Marshall Lucas and you know, mm-hmm. uh, and I just think it's a lot more inventive. The 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 action is a lot better i think especially i mean the death star run i think is just on a pure filmmaking level taking kind of a technology level out of it is the most exciting action scene in the saga um and no shots at our boy kirshner oh no, no shots, shots at kirshner, at kirshner. I, I listen empire strikes back is phenomenal it is almost as good i just uh, i think it's i'm a i'm i i sound like i don't like the movie when i talk about it sometimes because i get annoyed with the kind of foregone conclusion that people uh, have that it's the best Star Wars movie because it's like more serious, quote unquote, which I don't really buy into either. I think part of the reason it's so popular is that it's the funniest Star Wars movie by like a mile. Mm -hmm. It's actually really fun. Like it's not (laughs) that dark. I mean, obviously it ends on a down note, but uh, it's uh, it's a very fun movie. So, I mean, they're both great. You can't really go wrong. If you had ranked Empire above it, I would have disagreed, but not argued. You know, they, yeah, they're both exactly. phenomenal, so whatever. Our number three, talk. my number, number three, three, what's your number three? Revenge of the Sith. Exactly. Okay, so we have mm-hmm. the same list so far. Revenge of the Sith is my third favorite Star Wars movie by uh, a lot, actually. I think it's... It's the darkest of all the movies. That is a, it's mean, a, that's a dark have, movie. If Empire is the funniest, the, the funnest of them, and then you have the darkest of them all. Yeah, I... I mean, this movie, when it came out, was super well-reviewed and was well-liked, generally speaking, by everybody I ever talked to, including people mm-hmm. that did not like the first two prequels. And uh, it was my... Uh, I loved it. It's its probably the definitive Star Wars uh, experience for me. Obviously, Episode One was a huge kind of anticipation thing, but just the satisfaction of Revenge of the Sith was, was real, really pure for me. So, mm-hmm. over the course of time, of course, the general consensus became to just that all the prequels are bad, and whatever, we, we, we will be, <laughs> we are very much prequel people, so, like, you'll get yep. that sense, so if you're, you know, a jaded 45-year-old dude uh, that, you know, thinks his childhood was ruined because he didn't like a couple movies that came out in the early 2000s, and. Uh, you should probably stop listening to the show, but the um, but uh, <laughs> especially being that the the first books we're covering are prequel era books, so <laughs> uh, <laughs> I I I just uh, but Revenge of the Sith though I mean I just think the the filmmaking I think it's the closest to the original Star Wars in terms of style. I know a lot of people <laughs> would scratch their heads at that, but I'm talking about the cutting. I'm talking about the blocking. I'm talking about all this it's directed by the same person of course but i just think there's just a lot more inventive elements uh and i mean you know these are things that will come up on the show i don't want to spend too much yeah. time on that especially yeah, we'll, on the we'll get into stuff that. where we're we'll basically definitely get agreeing. into these at some point along the line so, so. i love all revenge right. of the sith uh number four on your list what is it return of the jedi also number four on mine see i feel like yeah, things are going to diverge after this this is going to be the kind of yes point. they are they are 100 percent diverging after four... this are uh, the same, and 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 I think that it, it, around the margins we have strong preferences and disagreements when it comes mm-hmm. to Star Wars, but the core of it we largely agree, and I think that's why we're a good pair for a, a, to host a podcast about Star Wars. I think so too. Um, I think so too. Because <laughs> we'll disagree sometimes, but we come at it from the same kind of angle, the same analytical angle, and I think Return <laughs> of the Jedi is now vastly underrated i know i ranked it fourth below one of the dreaded prequels but people talk about this movie as though it's like bad and it is weird to me like uh it's a phenomenal movie like like, it also has some of the 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 the, the throne room sequence is the best stuff in any of the movies i agree the first act is a creature flick like there's no humans almost in like for the first 20 minutes of the movie and it's just there's so much going on that's just so magical it shows so much of the magic of what star wars is uh in that the first bit i love that 
and people are going to bring up the Ewoks if they don't like this movie. That always inevitably happens. And I love the Ewoks, and here's part of the reason why. I think the Ewoks kind of reestablish the kind of radical politics of Star Wars after there's not really that much political material in Empire Strikes Back, which is fine, because that's mm-hmm. about the personal tragedy. But, it, but uh, you know, the evil empire in Star Wars, as we know, if you're... Uh, if you've read anything about it, or you just thought about it for a few <laughs> minutes, uh, is is the U.S. government and the U.S. military. So the and uh, and it, this is a series that's coming out of Vietnam, and I think that the Ewoks, being you know uh, this pr- quote unquote primitive people that are able to take down, be key in taking down the evil empire, you know, that's what it's all about guys and and it's reinforced in the prequels it's it's all about the kind of lefty politics of star wars that that as as a as an adult that i that i do i do love i get it up for it so the (laughs) um so uh um that's part of why i love the ewoks and also they're just they're cute get over it i'm sorry that you don't like cute they're adorable you you don't like do you like r2d2 because r2d2 is cute yeah Uh, anyway and and we'll talk more about R2-D2 and his just grand importance in the whole thing. All of right, course. so now number we're on five, to number five. I'm very five. curious. This is where we begin to diverge, I assume. This, this is where it falls apart. Oh, boy. Solo. Oh, no. This is... Okay. <laughs> Say that again so that people can hear. I'm... Here. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, solo, a Star Wars story. Number, number five, five Star Wars movie for Levi Parrish. Yeah. Yes, okay. I, I'm i sure this is going to change over the course of time. Uh, Solo, of course, is the, uh, what, depending on when you're listening to this, is the last Star Wars movie to come out. Um, this is a movie that I saw in the theater at least four times, mainly because every time I watched it, it left me just smiling ear to ear. Uh, this, to me, felt like a Star Wars movie, just like like a dream Star Wars movie for just like a 10-year-old boy who had like, a toy Millennium Falcon. That's what this movie felt like to me. And this movie, and to me also, this movie is one of the first movies to just really, I mean, all these movies have creatures in them. This is the first of the Disney movies to just nail the creatures in terms of the quality of the creatures and the scale of the creatures. Um, I know, Tim, you have some uh, pol- uh, political issues that are addressed in the movie uh, uh, with the droids. Uh, droid, uh, <laughs> okay, well, the, specifically. They're, 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 after what I just said about Jedi, you're making it sound uh, wrong. I. <laughs> this is what I'll say about Solo. It is, it is higher on my list uh, than you might think. Uh, it's oh, not really? at five. I do like Solo. I think uh, I think it's weird that this movie got such anger towards it because I w- I don't think there's a more skeptical person of this movie than me uh, going into it. I just I don't mm-hmm. have, I did not think it was possible to make a Han Solo movie without Harrison Ford. Like I think a lot of people, but uh, I liked it and Alden Ehrenreich was great. Uh, I thought he was better than Donald Glover in the movie. Donald Glover got all the attention because he's having an, mm-hmm. he had an incredible 2018 and all that stuff, you know, across the board with his show and everything. But uh, I thought Alden Ehrenreich didn't just do a Harrison Ford impression and and largely made the character his own to some degree. But he felt mm-hmm. like the character. There were some moments where he, he didn't. He, it's not a perfect performance, got... but. He got a lot of the mannerisms. He got a lot of the facial, like, tweaks of Han. There are moments where it's like Han just reacts and he just nails that perfect eye squint of Harrison Ford. And, like, and I mean, of course his voice sounds nothing like Harrison Ford, but, like, it was the best that we could have possibly gotten to Harrison Ford, in my opinion. I, I think I agree with that. And I, I don't mean to slight Donald Glover, who was also great. I just think he was doing a little more of an impression of Billy Dee Williams than Alden was. Mm-hmm. And I, yeah. I, I think it's a good movie. Like, I I, uh, I thought it was just an entertaining space adventure. And I think that's the problem with a lot of people is that they need Star Wars, every Star Wars movie that comes out, to be some sort of significant experience for them. And it's like... Yeah, some sort of spiritual journey. Like, they won out of it. I think Solo was just a very strong space opera movie. Uh, I I don't think it had much to really add to the character. I find 
if we're going to talk about Star Wars books later, I think the Han Solo Adventures by Brian Daly and the Han Solo Trilogy by A.C. Crispin are superior, like, Han stories. But mm-hmm. I thought this movie was a lot of fun. And, like, I, I, w- I would have... I, I, I was shocked coming out of it that at the time when we thought there might be a sequel, this was before the movie really came out, this was on mm-hmm. Thursday night, I was I thought, you know what, I'd actually be okay with the sequel. I liked the new supporting cast, you know, mm-hmm. Amelia Clark, everybody. I thought it was a very good movie. So we'll get to more of Solo a little, in a little bit. Um, my number no, five. No. Hang on, hang on. But before you say your number five, I want to quote my favorite line from Solo. Okay. I don't like it. I don't agree with it, but I accept it. That is so nice. I love that moment. That is a great moment. Uh, my number five, uh, and I still don't really have a great read of what how you feel about this movie, <laughs> but my number five is The Last Jedi. And okay, that's this, my number six. This is where... That's oh, my number oh, six. perfect. So this is where a ton of people are going to immediately just stop listening to the podcast, because mm-hmm. apparently this movie is like... It's like the prequels times 50, I feel like, <laughs> but uh, in terms of the <laughs> anger people have about it. Um, and listen, there are things about this movie that I have problems with. I don't love the situation that Luke is in at the beginning of the movie. I think it's mm-hmm. not where Luke would have gone in that situation. But I don't necessarily blame this movie for that. We'll get to that in a little while. JJ. Um, yeah, ex- exactly. I mean, that. Th- it- I don't need to beat around the bush. That's because of Force Awakens. And I, like, that's where they left him. And to me, The Last Jedi takes the most reasonable approach from the end of Force Awakens with Luke's character. Mm-hmm. And I just think there's a lot of great moments with Luke. I'm a huge Luke Skywalker fan. He's my favorite Star Wars character by a lot. Mm-hmm. And uh, I just think there's a lot of great moments. Every moment he has with a significant classic character is awesome. R2-D2. I agree. Uh, C-3PO, Leia, of course, um, uh, Chewie, even. Uh, just great little moments. And he felt like Luke to me, like, especially after, like, basically the first five minutes. It felt like people turned away from this movie after the first five minutes in terms of that aspect of it. And mm-hmm. that's frustrating. And as far as everything else in the movie, and I thought, oh, by the way, the ending with Luke is so cool. Like, I don't know why people... Uh, they, they, it's the hardest ending it, it's possible. It's unbelievably cool. And, like, I, you know, I could see the argument, oh, he didn't have to die, all that stuff. But he's going to be in the new movie a ton. Like, let's not be... Like, yeah, he, it'll be a Force Ghost, but he's going to be in it yeah. a lot. Um, and you know what? People people were making a big stink. This is, of course, just dumb rumor shit. But uh, Mark Hamill, of course, shaved his beard, so people were freaking out that he wasn't going to be in the movie. Let's be honest, people. This is Disney. He's showing up as a young Forced Ghost, I'm calling it now. Young Luke Forced That's Ghost. possible, but also, I mean, he's literally in the official cast list, so it's yeah, not exactly. even a That's speculation. True. Anyway, <laughs> I, I, the, as far as everything else in the movie, I mean, the characters that were introduced in Force Awakens that I think most people like, unless you're like a clown, you know, the, mm-hmm. you, you, the, oh. you know the kind of person we're talking about. Um, I know, I know. But, Anybody who thinks Rose is the worst character in the world, just stop listening right now. The new characters are handled super well. It makes it makes me, even though it's obviously sad that we won't have an original character living in the new movie, um, you know, for obvious reasons, that's depressing. It's also, I'm curious about the next movie because I love the new characters enough that I'm excited to see them anchor their own movie almost entirely so that's Mm -hmm. that's cool and uh yeah i just really like it i think ryan johnson just it's incredibly well made i love the 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 uh, snoke's throne room sequence is so cool like just the colors and i don't know i just think it's a really cool movie i I love all the moments between uh kylo ren and ray uh all the the force connections between them and what I, the way I feel about this movie is that out of all of these movies that Disney has produced, Last Jedi is the most ambitious one. And Ryan Johnson is the first guy to really take the reins and really try to do something original with these movies. He wasn't trying to play it safe. He was trying, trying to get people riled up while telling his own story. And I really commend him for that. Yeah, that's the thing. And I think Ryan Johnson is just a really talented filmmaker. I, I hope at some point that that supposed trilogy he was working on happens. We'll see if that actually happens. I know he has a, another movie coming out next year. But um, anyway, moving on from Last so Jedi. What's your, what's your number six? My then? number six. Yeah, that was your number six. My number six is yeah. Attack of the Clones. 
Ooh. This is, uh, okay. I feel like this is a, a big difference from you. You know what? Here's the thing, though. I've recently had a change of heart about Attack of the Clones, which we will get into later on the list, but I just rewatched Attack of the Clones recently, so... I won't spend too much time on it since it's coming up later on your list, but um, mm. I don't think it's a... It's not a great movie, but I will say it... almost everything about it has aged pretty well for me, except for, like, the green screen effects, which were mm-hmm. still trailblazing at the time, and I have no problem with. But... Um, like, even some of the stuff that was, I always thought of as laughable plays okay for me now. Like, the Anakin Padme stuff, one or two scenes aside, I think plays pretty well. It's a doomed romance. Yeah, and that's, it's that's, a toxic that's exactly how I felt relationship. Mm-hmm. But it's not... Uh, I, but I think that's how it's presented, and I don't really know. Oh, like, f- so I... Oh. Um, you know, there's some things I don't love, but... There's also I love you know Obi Wan Kenobi Gumshoe Detective on Kamino. Mm-hmm. All that stuff is a lot of fun. It feels weirdly small for how huge the events are. Like the beginning of the Clone mm-hmm. Wars, it seems a little like it feels a lot more low key than basically all the other main saga movies. Um, but I still like it a lot, and I think it's. Uh, pretty underrated and i think that climax rules the, so the like, climax rules the the coruscant chase rules yeah there's a lot of just um, cool action the, scenes the the jango fett um obi-wan rules and i'm gonna take a i don't know how you feel about this but i'm gonna say right now that the attack of the clone score is the best score of all the prequels mm, uh i could see that i love uh across the stars mm-hmm. uh i i love that revenge of the sith score I don't know. The prequel scores to me are the. Uh, I just think it's John Williams' greatest, certainly late career. I agree. Work. I agree. And I, I put them. I put the prequel scores above the new scores too. Like I sure, don't think yeah. the new scores have lived up to those. I, I think uh, those scores but... have been strong, but I, I, they're not. They're not on the same level for sure. No. Um, moving on to what's your what's your number seven? Okay, my number seven is Force Awakens. Okay. Yeah, uh, and. Here's my opinion of Force Awakens. I love the first two acts of Force Awakens. I hate the third act of Force this is Awakens. Basically, me. Uh, I have the movie yeah. lower, uh, but I I will I do want to stress. I think the first the first two acts are good. The first act is perfect, it's incredible, and incredible. It's incredible. I remember sitting in the theater just like, wow, they just nailed it. I can't believe how much I mm-hmm. love this. Um. I think basically everything up through when Han shows up basically is mm-hmm. impeccable. Perfect. Um, and uh, I'm not, uh, as far as the third act goes, I mean, we can save this a little bit if you want for when we get to it, to it on my list. So we'll talk about the positive okay, stuff now that, and we'll talk about the negative cause... stuff when we get to, my, to its place on my okay. list. Okay, that sounds like a plan. But I love um... all the new characters. The performances are incredible. There's some, I mean, the, the Falcon chase on uh, Jakku, Jakku is awesome. Like, I agree. so good. 100%. Like, the, people, I, people don't talk about this enough. J.J. Abrams is a phenomenal action director. Mm-hmm. And he has been for a long time. I mean, and, you know, I've always said no matter what he's done to Star Trek and Star Wars, uh, <laughs> And I, I say what he's done to them. Well, no matter what he's done, he will always have my my love for just the lost pilot. He's not even. I don't. Yes, the lost pilot is pure perfection. He's not. A, I don't think he. He's not. A, he's not a really considerable part of the show beyond that pilot. But he is. That pilot is so well made, and I love that show. So, um, it. I, I. I think he's just. He's great at set pieces. He's great at creating characters. He's great at setting things up. Um, you know, yes, as, and it, we will get to his flaws when we talk. We'll get to the flaws later. So Awakens, my number because... seven is that where we're at? I think so. Yeah, my number seven is the Phantom Menace. <laughs> okay, all right, and all this, right. Uh, people, uh, the Phantom Menace has uh, real problems. Uh, I don't want to like uh, gloss I over them. it. I love Phantom Menace, but I love the movie. I just can't stop. Like maybe I think this is. Partly our age, that is just... Mm-hmm. But, uh-huh. but I do also think there's some really just amazing stuff in that movie. I'm sorry, like, all the action scenes in that movie rule, except, like, the space mm-hmm. battle, which is, feels like an afterthought. But, like... But 
Um, th- it, I mean, obviously the lightsaber duel, but like also, uh, just you know, so many things. The pod race. I, the pod, the race, pod race, race is so a, many people bitch about the pod race, and the pod race rules. The pod race is incredible. Uh, I think there's just lots of new stuff added. I mean, I think Qui Gon is. We'll talk about Qui Gon a lot this episode. Mm-hmm, of course, Qui Gon is one of my favorite Star Wars characters, and it's not just because of expanded universe stuff. It's largely because of him in this movie, and he's amazing. I, I think that's a, such a cool idea. I love the Jedi Council. I love, I love so much stuff about this movie, and I think the movie looks really great. Like it's it's uh, the it's the best looking of all the prequels. Absolutely, movies. yeah. The the way I always feel about a Phantom Menace 2 is because it's so the the scale of the movie is so grand and the look to me has always felt like this is a renaissance Star Wars movie we have Jedi Knights we have Queens we have thrones and castles like this feels like kind of like almost in a way like a medieval Star Wars movie and it feels totally different than way later in A New Hope because government, of course, is way different, and that's something that George was, of course, building to. And I, uh, but, uh, I agree. Go I, ahead. This movie has a lot... I, I just... I, the problems with this movie, are, I think, are really one significant issue, and, and I know that people will... They're not gonna... It's not what you think it is. It's just I think that it's it, it needs a, a, another few passes in the edit room. Yeah, it's pretty sloppily thrown together, especially for a Star Wars movie. Star Wars known for kind of really sharp, inventive editing for action movies, and I think this uh, this movie's just really sloppily thrown together. And yeah, there's Jar Jar and Jake Lloyd's. We'll performance talk about Jar Jar when we get to him on my list. All that we but have that stuff is exacerbated, but that stuff would be maybe not that good no matter what, but it's exacerbated by the technical issues. Mm-hmm. Um, anyway, so moving on to number eight. Yeah. What's number eight on your list? Number eight on my list is episode two. Okay. Um, well, we've already talked about length at this. I don't think I have anything else to add about it. Uh, right, well, episode two is, is, is great. They're all great. That's all. Eight on my list is solo. Um, okay. Which we Sorry. talked at pretty great length about i'll just say that yeah i like the movie a lot i think I, to say some negative stuff uh the scene where he gets his name or whatever is one of the dumbest yeah, mm-hmm. scenes i've ever seen in a huge movie like that <laughs> and uh <laughs> and uh i think the uh the thing with darth maul at the end i i i, I thought it was kind of cool but i could just feel the confusion surrounding me in the mm-hmm. theater and i just thought mm-hmm. it was a weirdly place but thing. that's but that's why i think that movie goes so hard to pull out darth maul and just throw a wrench at everybody in the audience there is a lot the of fun time... like east if, if you're into the kind of stuff we'll be talking about on this podcast there's stuff in solo that is deep like there's Lando Calrissian adventures reference. I know. <laughs> it, it, so like, it, I appreciate that. I, I um um, but I think that that could have been any number of other characters, and it would not have confused the audience in the same way. Mm-hmm. Um, so anyway, moving on to number nine on your list. Okay, my number nine is episode one. Okay. So let's let's address Jar Jar. All right. Yeah, you. You're, people, I'll, I'll let you go with Jar Jar. People hate Jar Jar. <laughs> Um, obviously what George was trying to do with Jar Jar was he was trying to give a character for children to gravitate to a lot of the people who like the people who made Jar Jar Binks must die dot com are clearly people who grew up with the original movies saw this character in their middle age and didn't understand who this character was for I was eight at the time I didn't love Jar Jar, but I had a brother who was three, and my brother loved Jar Jar. I feel like we don't hear about it, but there's a generation of children who really, really found Jar Jar silly. Does Jar Does Jar Jar have some problems uh, in terms of uh, kind of just being a general annoyance? Yes, he does, but he was for the kids. I think the tide is not turning on Jar Jar because I think Jar Jar is not a particularly well realized character, and I think that's fair. Um, mm-hmm. But I think I think partially because of uh, Ahmed Best, uh, you know, coming out and talking about his experience with the fan harassment and all that stuff last year, 
there is something, um, there is definitely a more kind of, there. I've seen more people say like, well, I, you know, I was a little kid and I liked Jar Jar. And it's just like, and yeah, he doesn't really work in the movie when I watch it now, but like, I, it's stupid to be mad about that. And I, I agree. He's not even really in the movie as much as people might think he is. He's, he's, mm-hmm. uh, um, the Gungans are in there a lot, but he's not necessarily the focal point yeah. that much. And for, and for, and here's my argument for anybody who hates Jar Jar. Watch the rest of the prequel movies. Look what happens to Jar Jar. He gets manipulated by the Emperor, essentially, to give to give the Supreme Chancellor emergency powers, basically to... Uh, he is convinced to instill a dictatorship upon democracy. And then all his friends are either dead or have to go into hiding. So in the end of it all, Jar Jar, who is the purest of hearts in these movies, ends up with nothing. His whole world is destroyed at the end of these movies. So think about that next time you think Jar Jar is garbage. Yeah. Think about I, just what happened to that poor yeah, character. And like, yeah, that's the thing. You know, these... And, you know, if you want to talk about, you know, Jake Lloyd's performance, whatever. And he's a kid. Like, I, like that, that, you know, I don't blame George for a lot of things, but that's, his, that's on him to a large extent. And, uh, mm-hmm. you know, the fact that, you know that kid's life got ruined by that is very sad. Um, and, oh, that's so sad. And, um, you know, I hope, you know, he's still young enough. Hopefully he gets, he's able to get himself together uh, at some point. But um, I also think he's okay in the movie at certain points. He's kind of annoying at other points, but no worse than a lot of kid performances in a lot of movies of the same era. So, whatever. Uh, moving on uh, from Phantom Menace, what, what, that, that was your number... What is this? 10 that would be 10 all right so my your 10 are you sure that wasn't 10 that wasn't nine uh hang on i have oh no no you're right that's nine my so number, nine number nine is force awakens so okay uh i think you know to get into that third act i mean the star killer base is just one of the dumbest ideas that you could have possibly had doing mm-hmm. a third I death agree. star Impo- impossibly stupid i don't understand it's- how Especially in the context of the rest of the movies, you go from a, the second Death Star is in Return of the Jedi, and then boom, we are into Force Awakens, and oh, there's a third Death Star. It's it's so dumb. Yeah, and like so there's dumb. just a lot of silliness in that. And, and Han's death, I uh, I actually hate way more than Luke's death in Last Jedi. I like I. I think it's. I know it was obvious it was going to happen if, if they got Harrison back, and I get that that's like so nobody was surprised by it in the same way. But I think it at a storytelling level, it's a lot dumber. It's basically robs him of the happy ending of Return of the Jedi, which I think is bullshit. <laughs> um, you know, at least Luke got to die heroically, and he got to kind of like give his life for something. Han just is like, oh, you you're, you were a failure as a father, and your son turned to the dark side and murdered you. And it's like, eh, fuck off. <laughs> like, I, don't, I just don't like that. Um, uh, and, like, I can accept it when I'm watching these new movies, but it's just not what I... Uh, it's it's just not what I want from those characters. And to reiterate what I was talking about earlier... I do think, you know, I don't I don't care what they do in these new movies. The story is complete, you know, uh, to me, at mm-hmm. the end of Return of the Jedi. So I don't get as mad about as a lot of people, because I think a lot of people view this as, like, this is the life and, life and death, but I'm just like, okay, well, this just feels like a kind of, like, fan fiction with the original actors. So it, it elevates above fan fiction, but not that much. It's George isn't involved. It's not, doesn't really matter to me. Clone Wars is more real Star Wars to me than uh, the new movies. And that's not even a shot at them. It's just, you know, it's just fact. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> so, yeah, whatever. I think Force this, Awakens. This also, I, we have, I, I know we've talked about this personally before, but this is like a deeper problem with J.J. Abrams is that J.J. Abrams has a problem with third acts. Um, kind of in the course of his career, Cloverfield, an example of like a third act that, uh, not Cloverfield, um, Super eight. Super eight. Because Cloverfield is a Matt Reeves movie. Let's be fair. You know, no, yeah, yeah. So he has a he has a history with issues with third acts. Force Awakens has a third act problem, and I think going forward into Episode Nine, 
Uh, he's doing the third act of a third act, so I'm a little worried about this. Movie. I am concerned. Uh, I'm happy it's him and not Colin Trevorrow. Oh, um, but I God. am. <laughs> but uh, it does concern me. I was. I were if if I were to pick of the two directors that have made new movies so far, I, I wish it had been Ryan Johnson. But he wanted mm-hmm. a break, and I get it. Um, so anyway, moving on to number ten. What's your number ten? Uh, my number 10 is Rogue One. Also my number 10. It sounds like nice. our last two are going to be the same. Mm-hmm. So Rogue One, I... <laughs> okay, Rogue <laughs> One is fun. I, wanted... I want to I put agree. that forth first. The last 45 minutes I... of Rogue One are, are great fun. A great I agree. just fan service spectacle. And I don't mean that in a particularly negative way. I, I, I really had a great time. Uh, but that movie is empty Mm -hmm. especially the first like the first hour of the movie is is really really dry and if you don't like the prequels and the politics and the prequels it's like i don't see how you like rogue one either because this movie rogue one feels so much like a prequel it's very Um, dry there's i i i just don't think the characters are interesting i read the book uh catalyst in the lead up to rogue one by james lucino you also read that um, yes, great book. That book is fantastic, and it gives me it, it gave me anything to it gave me everything I was able to latch onto during the movie. None of that was provided by the movie. I I did not care about Jin because of the movie. I cared about her because she was the daughter of two characters I cared about from a book, and that's not great. I don't like I and I liked Cassie and Andor, so I'm looking forward to the show with him. I. I there's stuff I like about the movie. I thought, of course, Whitaker was a lot of fun. That's a goofy performance, <laughs> but it's an entertaining one. I just, I, I just didn't understand. I thought this was movie was fine. Like, there, there's nothing mm-hmm. I hate about it. It's just nothing special. And I was happy to see Bale or Ghana again. There, there are things that's, and it's something I, that may, for listeners, what may uh, peak uh, something that peaks our humor when Bale or Ghana shows up in the movie. We knew he was going to be in the movie, and we were really excited that he was going to be in the movie. He walks into the set. He doesn't say a word. And suddenly, the flurry of the John Williams hero theme shows up. <laughs> and then it cuts to a different scene. The man doesn't even speak. And I, I I laughed so hard. I was sitting in the front row of the theater, and I burst out laughing I was and people were staring at me with how hard I was laughing because I was in disbelief at the most confusing <laughs> use of the hero theme and the fact that all these people in the audience were just like who the hell was that character I have no idea who that was and why didn't he speak like there's just it was so baffling when it occurred that I just I couldn't help it uh, that, that makes me chuckle that uh, I'm just thinking about that I didn't see the movie with you but it was it's very funny. Uh, Rogue One, we're both kind of on the same page. It's fine, but I don't understand how it's anybody's favorite of the new movies or anything like that. That's mm-hmm. that's weird to me, but whatever. Number 11, the last one on our list... Uh, Clone Wars. It's Clone Wars. Uh, this is not even a movie, so I don't even feel like we need to talk about it that much. It came out in theaters. It's really just a long pilot. Mm-hmm. It's not very mm-hmm. good. Uh, it was an afterthought. George had the idea when he saw the the first three episodes completed was just like, why don't we just release this into a movie? And um, I'm a huge you know, Clone Wars fan. I I, I mm-hmm. love Clone Wars, but that show didn't really hit its stride till kind of the end of the first season and really season two. Um, right. Uh, um, and the but, guy who you know the co-creator of Clone Wars with Filoni, George, our is boy Dave Filoni, uh, who you know everybody knows, of course, that's listening to this. But uh, he he's he went to our alma mater where we went to college, Edinburgh University. Yes, he did. And uh, he came to our school uh, our freshman year, and we went to see him. We didn't know each other at that. I night. got his autograph. So I sat behind him. Very nice it guy. Was an awesome he moment. talked for a little bit to uh, everybody that came up to him, and he was a nice guy. So uh, you know, uh, it, maybe if this show goes on a long time, maybe we can talk to Dave Filoni because of that Edinburgh that connection. Great. But we'll see what happens. Uh, but but and he was also the only Edinburgh graduate to ever direct a wide release feature film, so that's pretty cool. Yes. Um. But yeah. he, he's uh, 
but I, I, uh, I bet th- those episodes are not very good. And like uh, Zero the Hut, terrible Truman Capote the Hut. I don't, I don't need that in my <laughs> life. But, uh, but and there are so many later ones that would have been great, like theatrical movies that they didn't, you know, whatever the the uh, the Mortis episodes would have been so cool in theaters. But oh well. Um, so anyway, that is that gives you a sense, I hope, of our kind of Star Wars taste. Oh. Oh, real, real quick, though, I'm going to rank the two other movies that you haven't gotten a chance to... Uh, well, you haven't seen one of these movies. Uh, but on the bottom of my list, I am going to put the second Ewok movie at number 12 and the first Ewok movie at number 13. So people seem to forget these exist. And they but did come out in the theaters thing. in Europe. So, um, oh, I didn't know that. So they, should, they maybe should be on the list. I, uh, I've seen the first one, uh, back in college, uh, but I have not seen, uh, the second one yet still. I have a bootleg of it that I could watch. It uh, has, I want to talk about it so bad because it has the most, it has the hardest opening and I'm ranking it at number 12 on the opening of that movie alone. Well, I, uh, so. I will definitely watch them and we will talk about them in a future episode. Let, let's, this, uh, opening segment... We've, we've talked for about 45 minutes. Uh, <laughs> this show is going to be long-winded, guys. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> we uh, this opening segment, some weeks we're going to do uh, lists. Some weeks we're just going to talk about general Star Wars topics. So maybe in the future we'll do an Ewoks movie uh, opening Got segment. It. But we just want to give people... We want to talk about Star Wars in other ways besides the main focus of the show, which is the junior novels, of course. Uh, so... Uh, <laughs> Anyway, uh, I please come right back. We'll be back with yes. more Padawan Library. Hi, friends. Buddy Barry here, former Grav Ball champion turned celebrity chef. Did you know that I grew up on Naboo? And one of my childhood best friends was none other than Sheev Palpatine. When Buddy Barry found out his buddy championed his way to become Emperor of the Known Universe, Buddy Barry wanted to commemorate his buddy on all his hard work. That's why I opened Sheev's Cheeseburger Bar and Grill. Sheev's Cheeseburger Bar and Grill, yeah! I'm not just serving any old burger, I'm serving Grade A Bantha Burgers. (laughs) Our meat is imported directly from Tatooine and cooked to your desired temperature. Bloody, rare, medium rare, medium well, well, and my personal favorite, dark side. Good. Sheaves is fun for the whole family. Kids eat free on Tuesdays and receive a 10% discount with any active Imperial ID. So come on down to Sheaves Cheeseburger Bar and Grill. Tell them, buddy Sheave. Do it. Sheaves Cheeseburger Bar and Grill, yeah. <laughs> Welcome back to Padawan Library. This week on our first episode, we will be discussing Jedi Apprentice number one, The Rising Force by Dave Wolverton. Uh, This book came out in 1999. It was a tie-in to uh, The Phantom Menace. Um, And it was the first book of 18 in a series, plus a few special editions uh, that stretched through basically the release of Attack of the Clones in 2002. Um, we, uh, uh, we decided to start with this because it's our kind of uh, near the beginning. It's right from our wheelhouse. Uh, whether, I don't know. Did you read this at all when it came out? I, um, I actually read, I want to say book 12 or 13, um, the something experiment. And it just has like Qui-Gon on the cover, like chained to what looks to be like, uh, like uh, just some sort of the like torture experiment. device on it, and I saw that cover, and I was like, "Oh, damn, Qui Gon." I read this one and maybe the second one when they first came out, um, but I didn't continue beyond that, even though I liked it quite a bit. Um, uh, but we'll talk about that further. Uh, you have some information about the author, Dave Wolverton, yes. who only wrote the Dave... first book in this series. Yes, Dave Wolverton. Um, he sometimes goes by the name of David Farland. That's another name he goes by. And according to his website, he is the wizard of storytelling. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's exactly what his website says. His website is so silly because it says very big in the corner, David Farland. And in tiny text underneath David Farland, it says uh, Dave Wolverton. Um 
He uh, has written over 50 books, and one of his most famous series is the uh, Rune Lord series. Uh, it's a, f a series of fantasy novels. Um, he, uh, he's written, and this is on his website, he has written for major franchises, including Star Wars, which he has written 15 Star Wars novels. Um, most of them were Star Wars mission books the, um, that see, came out this, around the same time. The Star Wars missions are interesting. I think that was, if I recall correctly, I think I had some of these. They were like kind of like baby role-playing game books, basically. Mm-hmm. They were sent with like Star Wars Kids Magazine or Star Wars Insider, maybe in the late '90s, um, and I remember having a few of them. Uh, where I know Dave Wolverton from is The Courtship of Princess Leia, which is the only adult novel I think that he wrote for Star Wars, mm -hmm. um, which is a, movie, a book that I remember liking as a kid, and then the more I think about it, I'm not a huge fan of it. <laughs> but it was where Han and Leia <laughs> got married, basically, so um, in the old canon. So it is a significant yeah. work in that regard. Um, and then another fr another franchise he's written for, and uh, you're going to find this funny, and a listener of this podcast and future guest to this podcast, our friend Sam, is going to find this very funny. He is also written for The Mummy. <laughs> and he, he, he awesome. wrote a series. He wrote a series called The Mummy Chronicles. There were four books. They are This entitled... is in the Brendan Fraser Mummy verse, yes. correct? Okay. Yes, it is. The Somers uh, verse. Stephen yes. Somers. Yes. The four books are Heart of the Pharaoh, Flight of the Phoenix, not to be confused with the Jimmy Stewart movie, Curse of the Nile, and this Sam is going to, he needs this book, Revenge of the Scorpion King. Oh, man. Well, uh, I know what I'm getting him for his birthday this year. So, uh, <laughs> but to move on, Dave Wolverton, interestingly, he wrote the first book in this uh, series, and uh, according to Wikipedia, he co-wrote the third book with yeah, the series' eventual writer, Jude Watson, although I found no evidence of that anywhere else. Yeah, um, there, it's not, there's there's actually no about the authors in these books either, which is Of odd. course not. Uh, um, it's a, the, I, these, these are very cheaply produced. There's ads in the back, that kind of thing. It, mm -hmm. it, 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 they were essentially... I think they were bi-monthly or something. They came out very frequently. Yeah. Um, I have I, I have one more fun factoid. Okay. I know we're trying to get through this book. That's In 1998, right. Dave Wolverton broke the world record for most books signed in one sitting. Oh. And I could not find the number of how many books he signed. I tried so hard because the problem is I was on the Guinness website and when the new record is like beaten, they don't show like what the previous records hey, were. Hey Guinness, but get your shit together, my I guy. I know. Their website <laughs> sucked. However, I do know that You should that have a record 2000... of all the records all the way back to I the know. beginning of Guinness. What the hell? I know. Get in a 2000... new webmaster. <laughs> in 2016, the record was broken by Vikran Vikrant Mahan from India and okay. in one sitting in one sitting he signed 6,904 books wow <laughs> <laughs> that sounds exhausting alright well so Dave Wolverton interestingly yeah so he only wrote really the first book in this series that was ultimately taken over by Jude Watson who had a very long Star Wars career that and he's probably the author will be reading the most work by in this podcast, at least in the early going. Um, but let's get started with Jedi Apprentice, The Rising Force. Uh, this is uh, the first book in a series, and, and the, the premise of the series is, is it's uh, about Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan prior to The Phantom Menace, um, about how they kind of became uh, Master and Apprentice, and uh, their adventures prior to the first film. Uh, Qui-Gon uh, is one of my favorite characters. Uh, so, and I love Obi-Wan too, especially uh, slightly older Obi-Wan, so I'm curious about Jedi Quest going in the future. Um, but this, uh, but anyway, so the book begins with Obi-Wan still at the Jedi Temple as a youngling. Uh, yes, although he's, that he's phrase... That phrase didn't really exist in Star Wars lore at the time, so there's no use of the word youngling in this book, which I thought was notable, if not surprising. Um, that kind of came about around Attack of the Clones time. Mm -hmm. um, 
But um, this this book does take place in in just case people are wondering, forty four BBY. So forty four um, years before the Battle of Yavin or a New Hope. Yes, um, and Phantom Menace is thirty two BBY. Obi Wan is twelve years old at the time of this novel. Yes. Um, something apparently. It the uh, he's lived most of his life in the Jedi Temple as a uh, as a learner, um, but apparently when you turn thirteen, um, you either have to be chosen by a Jedi Knight to become a Padawan, or you get, get shipped sent off to the into other facets, core. <laughs> or you become a healer. Uh, oh, that's true. Is one of, of course, the there things. are many yes. options, but. But Obi Wan's terrified of the agricultural core. <laughs> yes, um, it's three there, weeks till his birthday. It's a lot of fun to see kind of the different types of like Jedi lore that are introduced in all different types of expanded universe material. That they don't contradict each other, but it's like here's one way uh, we think early Jedi training goes, and here's another way. And like, I, and the, so I'm always curious about that because I feel like depending on who the the audience for the book is or whatever it can be a little bit different so um obi-wan is nearing the end of his time at the jedi temple he's 12 and yeah when he turns 13 he'll have to they'll make some sort of decision and qui-gon is coming he's coming to the jedi yes, temple the following day yes. and he's gonna be uh uh and he's gonna maybe take on an apprentice although it's heavily intimated that qui-gon had had an apprentice earlier um, yes. uh, and something bad happened. We don't really know. Did he turn to the dark side? Did he die? We don't really know. Um, yeah, and Qui-Gon seems a little jaded by this thing. He showed up at the Jedi Temple before and watched uh, young Jedi uh, participate, but he has not chosen an apprentice. So because of this, poor Obi-Wan, who is wants to be a Jedi Knight so badly, it's his dream to be a Jedi Knight, he is extremely worried of whether or not he is going to be picked or not and whether or not his dream is going to be fulfilled. And so uh, there's there's this asshole and his name is Brock, Brock Chun. Chun. Brock <laughs> Chun. He, <laughs> he's a classmate of Obi-Wan's who uh, he also wants to become an apprentice and he'll do anything. And he anything. is the second he is the second oldest uh, young Jedi learner at, at the temple currently. He um, will do anything is, to be chosen. He's a bit of a, he's a bully. He's nothing but a big old bully. Now, uh, the, just to give you an idea, Brock Chun is a very creative boy. He came up with a scathing, mean nickname for Obi-Wan. He calls Obi-Wan ofi Wan. Obi-Wan Kenobi. Obi-Wan Kenobi. And this, apparently, we uh, we are told in the book that Obi-Wan was walking down a hallway at the temple and passed Bruk Chun, and the two of them accidentally ran into each other and fell on the ground. And because Obi-Wan was such an, uh, an Ophi dunce i guess i don't know he was this is where brock got the genius name for ofi one kenobi now we'll talk more about ofi one in the weeks ahead but <laughs> brock chun uh kind of baits obi-wan into a fight and mm -hmm. uh they they get into it uh, a fight of sabers a lightsaber fight right and so yes Ultimately, neither of them is really injured, but Brock pretends he's injured and goes to the healers and, like, tries to, like, make it seem like Obi-Wan attacked him unprovoked, like the little shit that he is. <laughs> and so, <laughs> and uh, the Masters uh, believe this largely initially, especially Mace Windu, who believes fucking anything, as we know. And <laughs> uh, Yoda is suspicious, though. Yoda's a little suspicious, but... Meanwhile, the, the Masters decide Obi-Wan is just definitely not going to be a Jedi Knight. He's definitely going into the agricultural... Uh, uh, he's definitely going into the agricultural core. And uh, that's that's that. Uh, so Obi-Wan's devastated by this news that he's going into the agricultural core. And, uh, and so 
but he's he's especially sad because like he doesn't even want to say goodbye to his friends, including Reefed, Grand Mull, uh, not Reefed. I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm sorry, Garen Mulm, who is also who is a Reefed Drosselian. <laughs> I think that's what it is. Oh wait, no, Garen Mull. I I am not reading my notes correctly. Debbie, De- <laughs> De- give me one minute. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Obi Wan is devastated by this news, and uh, he's so devastated that he can't even say goodbye to his friends, including his human friend Garen Mom, or Reefed, his Dresselian friend, or most of all, Bant, the mysterious Mon Cala girl. That does he have a crush uh-huh. on? We don't know. We don't know. And we I actually, know. I would like you to open your book. To page, page 19. 19. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, and I would like to have a reading. I will start. Um, okay. So, let's see. Actually, page 18. It starts here. Okay. Uh, okay. Where do you want to start at? At the very bottom. I'm going to read the first part, and, and you, you, we'll, we'll trade off here a little bit. Uh, okay. Uh, Bant... The Mon Cala girl comes to Obi-Wan's room. She's upset that he hasn't said goodbye because he's about to leave. And this is what happens. Obi-Wan shook his head. It's just the agricultural corps. How dangerous could it get? We are not to know, Bant said. We are to do, Obi-Wan added softly. It was a phrase they had heard many times from the masters. When they were asked to do tasks they could not understand the significance of. Miss you, I will, Bant said, echoing Yoda's strange way of talking. She blinked back tears. So sorry, I am, Obi-Wan answered. (laughs) 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 That's just delightful. That's the writing you come to from the master of storytelling himself. Wizard of storytelling? Which one? Wizard of storytelling. Wizard of storytelling, Dave Wolverton. (laughs) <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> I just thought that was very goofy. Uh, but anyway, so they say goodbye, but then Yoda uh, talks to some droid who has like surveillance footage that the masters didn't think to look at earlier. <laughs> um, and uh, it basically exonerates uh, o- Ophi Wan himself. And they see that yes. he was baited into it, but. The Masters are still like, oh, he's too immature. He's still able to be baited into a fight. So um, we'll and let him try out for Qui-Gon, but eh, uh, we still one, think he's probably not Jedi Knight material, if you know what I mean. Something I really liked about this book was that Dave Wolverton kind of understood there's uh, one of Obi-Wan's character traits is that Obi-Wan can kind of be snarky, and Obi-Wan has the perfect comeback to everything just watch uh, attack of the clones and every interaction between him and anakin everything anakin says obi-wan has something hilarious to say back to him that just destroys anakin and there's a moment (laughs) on page 23 and one of the jokes between brant and obi-wan is that uh not brant um brock is that brock is going to the agricultural corpse so the (laughs) So I'm going to read a a section here. Um, Okay, maybe I won't read a section here. Uh, But essentially, um, Brock threw a fruit at Obi-Wan in the lunchroom. And he yelled, plant it, Ophi. I hear they'll grow just about anywhere. And Obi-Wan, well, Obi-Wan's best friend, Reef muttered, I don't mean to sound greedy, but are you going to eat that barbell fruit? Obi-Wan nearly burst out laughing. Thank you, Bruck, he said, scraping the fruit off the table and placing it in a cup. The people of Bandamere will be honored when I share them your gift, the gift of one farmer to another. (laughs) (laughs) Crushed, crushed, Obi-Wan, even at age 12, crushing people left and right. Oh my god, that's amazing. So basically, I want to. We should probably speed through some of this setup a yes, little we bit. Should. But he basically, you know, he fights Brook like in front of Qui Gon. Qui Gon's like very impressive, but you're too angry. Like 
nah, sorry, not going to take you on as an apprentice. Then Yoda's like, hey, hey Qui-Gon, you're going to Bandamere, right? So is Obi-Wan. So you're going to have to be around <laughs> this dude. So Qui-Gon is like, be, has been sent to Bandamere, this planet, uh, by the Senate. And Obi-Wan is going there to join the Agricultural Corps on that planet. So uh, Yoda swears he did not plan this this way, but it seems like maybe he's lying. Um, <laughs> anyway, so then uh, they get on this ship called the Monument, uh, which is a Karelian barge, and it uh, it's populated by two distinct kind of groups. There's uh, this one, the off-world organization that's kind of a... a um, the mining uh, company, corporate, yeah, yeah and the off-world mining corporation. It's run by uh, a guy named Jemba the Hut. Um, <laughs> it's run by the Huts basically, but it includes some uh, some it includes whippets and humans also. Um, and then so they have one side of the ship, but the ship isn't owned by them. The ship is uh, owned by. Uh, the the Arconans who are traveling, or is it the Arconans, or is it? Cla- I, I'm a little. I, I don't know if it's Arconans or Arcona. Uh, I, we'll just go with Arconan. Um, they are the Arconan Mineral Harvest Corporation, and I got that from Wikipedia. I don't actually remember reading that in the book. Um, however, no, I have, these I have two... it here, and I did not look at Wikipedia. So okay, minutes, so. so these these two factions, the Offworld and the Arconans are kind of at odds with each other um, because um, the Offworld Mining Corporation uh, runs mostly off of slave labor. And uh, Jemba. And Jemba, of course, is the master slave owner. and He, he might have committed only... genocide on a planet called Varistad by popping a hole in the artificial atmosphere, killing a quarter million people to buy oh the mining right, buy the mineral rights cheap and make a huge profit. That is some evil shit right there. Uh, mm-hmm. Jemba's like maybe one of the more evil uh, villains I've read about in Star Wars. Yeah, exactly. I mean, and and Plata the, uh, also, Plata, who is the kind of human. Uh, kind yeah, of, she's a she, female she's human. The, uh, she kind of befriends Obi-Wan, who kind of got into a bit of a scrap with one of the huts. Um, and she takes him over to the Arconan side of the ship. And uh, she tells Obi-Wan that, you know... Oh, like I don't know anybody on Varastad, but she's obviously lying. That doesn't come up again in the book, but I assume that'll come up again in the future. Um, but anyway, so Qui Gon's also on the ship. He comes to see Obi Wan while he's recovering from oh. these injuries. He's sustained. Real from quick, a hug. though, real quick between the two factions, the Arcona Mineral Harvest Corporation is a profit sharing company. They share their profits with oh. their employees. So this is a major difference between uh, Jemba the Hutt's uh, slave labor camp. Exactly. Uh, so this I, is, I, I this I is why these two that, are Dave. at odds. Good, good for Dave Wolverton, the Wizard of Storytelling. Uh, for uh, staying true to the spirit of uh, Star Wars storytelling, which is, you know, uh, uh, you know super uh, progressive politics. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> um, so I, uh, I think, uh, let's see. Obi-Wan, oh, it should oh, be known that so, um, there are multiple huts on the ship. Including... Uh, Jemba is the... Uh, Grelb the Hut, Gre- who is Grelb, the, Grelb, Grelb the Hut, who Gre- is kind of the right hand man of Jemba, and he's the guy who attacked Obi Wan. I mean, that's not revealed till later, but whatever, you know, spoilers for the show. <laughs> um, uh, so Qui Gon's also on the ship. He kind of visits Obi Wan while he's recovering, and he gets to know Clata a little bit, who seems kind of into him. If, you're, if I'm being honest. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I felt that way too. <laughs> yeah. oh, we'll see if that develops at all. But um, you know, uh, Clata, you know, uh, thinks that these are Conan tunneling machines have been sabotaged, and it's like that's Jemba all the way. And then Jemba just shows up in the room, and he's just like, "No, it was not me." And uh, uh, 
and like Qui Gon. He, he also tries. He also tries to claim that like that he's being accused. Like he's trying to accuse like the humans of being essentially racist towards the Huts. He tries to pull the yeah. race card on everybody. It's 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 kind of like the people that. Uh, you know the the kind of racist Italians that were mad about the Sopranos. Uh, <laughs> yeah, what are they trying to deflect from? You know, but uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, so Qui Gon uh, prevents kind of any sort of altercation from happening. He mediates the situation like Qui Gon would, and uh, so uh, <laughs> Obi Wan uh, is like, I want to investigate and Qui-Gon's like stay in your room and Obi-Wan's like you're not my master you can't tell me what to do so he recruits an Arconan named Sai Trimba would you say Sai Trimba? Yes. Sai, Sai Trimba and also just for the people at home who don't know what an Arconan looks like um, in the cantina uh, the the one creature who has a very triangular head with golden eyes uh, his name is Hem Dazon, depending on how much you know the character names of the cantina. Hem Dazon is a Arcona. There you go. You can he's look very that much, up. He's, he's very much the creature that looks like he is a head on a stick, who moves like a head on a stick. Yes, yes. And so Cytrimba is, is, is a brethren of his. And that, that's actually serious, that the, at least in this book's uh, kind of continuity, there's uh, this sense that all the Arconans are kind of like one living organism, kind of like the collective unconsciousness if it took a full single consciousness. So they always refer to themselves yeah. as we, um, which is interesting. I, if somewhat confusing, I have to say the way it's written often because then Obi-Wan will be like, we need to do this. You know, it's just, but, uh, but interesting though. Um, and not much has yet been done with that, but I assume, I assume Cy Trimba is kind of a character that continues to show up throughout this series. Because he becomes Obi Wan's good friend. Um, yes. Anyway, and that's what so this is all about friendship. Absolutely. And Obi Wan and Sidetrimba go kind of sneaking around, and they Sidetrimba gets captured by uh, by Grell, I believe. Uh, and uh, and then uh, Obi Wan is so, able to. Uh, Obi Wan runs, but then he's like, "Nah, I gotta go help this guy," and he, he's able to save him. But they get back, and Qui-Gon and Klaatha are pissed, of course, because they told them not to leave, you know? So... Mm -hmm. Now, now something I want to say here, something about Arcanas is there's a moment where Obi-Wan and uh, Sai are having lunch together, and Sai ingests something called Dactyl, and what Dactyl is is a yellow crystal made of most it's like an ammonia based sort of food and uh, the Arconas eat Dactyl uh, like humans need water um, and apparently that salt is very bad for them so when Obi-Wan goes to rescue Cytrimba he looks like death all the color is drained out of him and Grell mentions that they injected him full of a salt like they must have had a syringe and they pumped him full of salt and poor Sai was on death's door uh before obi-wan got there and so obi-wan saved his life and these uh the dactyl that the arcanas need uh become a bigger a bigger role later in the book yeah and that is important for later so um when they get back qui-gon's pissed of course he's scolding obi-wan but just as that's happened pirates attack the ship and the pirates are Togorians, uh, Togorians, uh, like, like Togor <laughs> from Manos the Hands of Fate for my shitty movie heads out there. Um, <laughs> uh, I just imagine they look like him and they walk like goats. Um, although I haven't really looked up the Togorians. <laughs> they are cats. They are large cats. Large cats. Okay, that that's interesting. Um, but mm -hmm. anyway, so they attack the ship. Qui Gon's like. I'll handle the people that are boarding the ship, the, the pirates boarding the ship. You go fly us out of here, you know, to avoid any more people boarding. And Qui-Gon gets all fucked up, uh, and he, he and Grelb sees that Qui-Gon's getting fucked up, so he begins to scheme. And he's like, hmm, what am I going to do? What will I do to, to undercut everyone? Uh, Obi-Wan's able to shake them. He's able to fly, you know, out of the range of the Tagorian pirates. Um, and land on a mysterious planet with uh, 
with some uh, interesting creatures that we'll get to later in the show. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, Qui Gon got it was super fucked up. Um, but yeah, he he's... got a vibro axe to the shoulder oh. to the point that he couldn't even use his left arm, and so, and so he goes to the healing. medic. And like, yeah, he's using the force to heal himself. And Obi Wan, he's like, he's like, he's starting to see some more potential in Obi Wan. He's like, okay, I see where this kid's like pretty good, you know. But I still don't know if I want to do this because he's obviously feeling something about, and, and he's finally named his old Padawan Xanatos. Uh, and uh, so he he doesn't know how to feel about it, and we don't know how to feel because we don't know anything about this guy. Um, but you know, uh, Cytrimba comes into the room with Obi Wan and Qui Gon, and he's just like, "The dactyl has been stolen by Jemba," and so this is important. This is the lifeblood, basically, of the entire all of the Arconans on the ship, and uh, Jemba has taken it as leverage, basically. Um, yes, and he he has promised to give it back, but what the Arconans have to do is they have to join the Offworld Mining Corporation and become slave labor. They have to sacrifice their lives to the Offworld Mining Corporation so that they can survive. Jemba definitely feels like he has all the cards here. And this is interesting because, you know, Obi-Wan's furious about this. Of course, but Qui Gon's trying to stay calm and, and work through the situation, like a Jedi would. And this is interesting, you know. Uh, you know, uh, Qui Gon uh, says something really cool on page one hundred nine. It's like one of my, it's actually one of the better like Jedi, cool Jedi things I've read in a non movie Star Wars thing. And so he says, uh, "Anger is our enemy." Qui Gon said reasonably. He shot a glare across the room to Jemba. Greed and fear are also our enemies. The Arconans can live without Dactyl for a while. You do not need to fight now. Haste is another enemy. As it's like, that is true. That sounds like Qui-Gon. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, so I yeah. I agree. Um, the Arconans are about to accept this offer. Like, they're, like they're about to just give in to it. Um, but Obi-Wan kind of stops Sightream, but he's just like, hey, like, you should try to stay with me. Like, I know, like, this is against your nature that you guys kind of all think as one, you're one big living organism in some ways, but you guys, and like, you don't necessarily value freedom the same way humans do and all that stuff. But I think we can stop this from happening. And Cytrimba makes the huge decision to stay behind. Um, and that's, that's a, one of the more like kind of rousing moments of the book. And then all the Arconans follow Cytrimba back to Obi-Wan's side. And that, I thought that was such a cool moment. It was like, uh, it was just, uh, it, it, seeing that kind of like, uh, that right in the face of just a, a pig, uh, like right. Jemba. It was just so, so inspiring to me. And that's what I come to Star Wars for in a lot of ways. Um, yes. So, so f fast forward, they're on a uncharted planet. This on Wikipedia, this planet actually has no name. Exactly. This planet, this planet is simply called um, un unidentified blue marble planet. So, if you're <laughs> looking for this planet on Wikipedia, unidentified blue marble planet is what you need to search. And make sure you're on um, the Legends this... tab, of course. Yes, um, this uh, planet is uh, a hostile planet. It's made up of oceans and mountains and volcanoes. And on this planet, it is uh, ruled by uh, terrifying creatures known as dragons. Or is it dragons? Uh, not to be confused. Or dragons? I don't know. Uh, it looks like dragon, but there's an I in there after the A. <laughs> well, we'll talk a lot about dragons or dragons uh, in, 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 in soon. Uh, I don't. There, there's not a ton to talk about, but I would like to table that issue for the time being. But they do play a role in the story. So okay. basically, uh, you know. <laughs> Qui-Gon's super proud of Obi-Wan because uh, of what he did. Uh, and uh, he drops, like, serious Jedi knowledge on pages 116 through 118. I have written here. I actually don't remember what that is. 
Uh, oh, well, let's <laughs> um, let's go see one sixteen through one eighteen. I I said he drops serious Jedi knowledge. So let's see here. Um, Look, you're wounded, Obi Wan said. I know you can't fight now, but I could do it for you. I can hold back my anger and do what must need to be done. If Jemba were dead, nothing would change. Qui Gon said warily. Obi-Wan, can't you see? Killing Jemba is not the answer. Jemba is but one hut. There are always more, just as evil and greedy as he is. If you kill him, it won't stop his plan from going forward. Another like him, perhaps someone worse, will take his place. What we must do is try to teach these people that... But isn't... But he is evil, isn't he? Obi-Wan asked. What Jemba is trying to do is wrong, Qui-Gon answered carefully. I've never seen anybody who was so evil, Obi-Wan burst out. A sad smile touched Qui-Gon's lips. And have you been so many places, young Obi-Wan? Obi-Wan fell silent. He had much to learn. His heart cried out that Jemba was evil, and that evil had spread to enslave innocent victims. If anybody deserved to meet a bitter fate, it was the hut. But he would listen to Qui-Gon. I've seen far worse, Qui-Gon continued. If you think of killing in anger, you must know such thoughts come from the dark side. Then how can we make him give the dactyl back, Obi-Wan asked. You can't. You can't force people to be just and decent. Such qualities must arise from within. They cannot be forced from without. For now, I choose to wait. Perhaps Jemba will have a change of heart, or perhaps some darker fate awaits him. In either case, killing is not the solution. But... You've killed before, Obi-Wan added hesitantly. I have, Qui-Gon admitted, when there was no other choice. But when I kill, I only win a fight. It's a small, small victory. There are greater battles to be won, battles of the heart. Sometimes, with patience and reason and by setting a good example, I have won more than a fight. I have turned my adversary into a friend. Oh, that Damn. is some deep, deep Jedi shit right there. I love that. <laughs> um, anyway, I'm glad that we read that. I was like, well, we'll see how this goes. But yeah, uh, <laughs> that turned out good. <laughs> anyway, so uh, anyway, so but Obi Wan's still like, even though after that he's still like, I just I'm not ready to take you on as an apprentice. Um, and so the tide is coming, and it might swamp the ship. So yes, the engine, the engines of the ship are damaged. They need repaired, but the tide is coming in and they must evacuate the ship immediately because soon they're all going to be underwater. So everybody in the ship has to quickly retreat up a mountain into these caves except while not for, provoking the dragons, except for Qui-Gon who decides he's going to take advantage of this and he's going to use this to try to steal the dactyl back from Jemba. Um, and he goes up kind of a, is it a mountain basically? He's cl yeah. climbing up a mountain and the, the dragons are going insane all around. Like, it's just like they're circling the top of this mountain and Grelb is on Qui-Gon's trail. And so, yes. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, uh, <laughs> The, uh, the Whippids are at the top of the mountain with Jemba. Not Jemba, Grelb, sorry. Grelb, yes. The Whippids are at the top of the mountain with Grelb. They all have blasters. They see Qui-Gon scaling the mountain. His shoulder hurts. He can barely move. He's only, The force is what's driving him up this mountain to get the Dactyl back. So Grelb sees him down there, and he's like, mm, I'm going to have a little fun. Start blasting him, boys. So the Whippids start blasting, and he's like, oh, I'm going to bet you guys who can blast off his foot, and they start shooting at him. And all this blasting, little did they know, stir up the dragons. And before they can blast Qui-Gon off the mountain, the dragons start swooping in and just eating the Whippids left and right. And Grelb is like, oh my god, what is going on? I'm terrified. And Grelb runs away. And here's the thing. Remember when we were reading just a minute ago that Qui-Gon talking about turning an enemy into a friend? Well, who's the greatest enemy of all? The dragons! And, oh, and Qui-Gon turns one of them into a friend, and he rides him back down the mountain once he's retrieved the dactyl. 
<laughs> and there's a moment here. There's a moment here where it, uh, he. Obi Qui Gon is cornered. He's in the cave. He's got the dactyl, but there's a dragon at the at the just there, just tearing at it, trying to get to him. And suddenly, he hears a voice call out through him through the Force, and it's Obi Wan. And Obi Wan is in the cave with the Arconas. They're all dying. And in a a moment of desperation, he reaches out into the Force to call a Qui Gon that we need help. And in that moment, Qui Gon leaps out of the cave. He j- makes a leap of faith, and he ends up on the back of one of the dragons. And he uses his powers of the Force to control the dragon. Exactly. He befriends. His enemy, the dragon, or the dragon. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I, and they, he flies back down the mountain. Um, all this time, Jemba showed up in the cave, right? And he's trying to. Yes. He's like, he's taunting the Arconans, like saying, no. like, "I'll sell you some of this dactyl," like, and he knows they can't afford it, whatever. And he's, being, got- he's being a real shithead, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and so. Uh, oh, this pisses Obi Wan off, and like, hey god, hey I have a quote here that is hilarious. <laughs> okay, so, oh, so Jemba is blocking the entrance to the cave, and Obi Wan senses that danger is coming. He has his lightsaber out. He is in front of Jemba the Hut. This is a section that I'm about to read. Danger was coming to all of them. Qui-Gon wasn't just calling for help. He was trying to warn Obi-Wan. I mean it, Jemba, Obi-Wan warned. We're all in trouble. This is Jemba here. What would you... (laughs) What would you have of me, little one? Jemba asked. Do you want me to look down at my shoes so that you can stab me? Ho, ho, ho. That trick won't work on me. Huts don't have feet. (laughs) It's true. They don't have feet. (laughs) <laughs> and it's at that moment Obi-Wan does a flying somersault over Jemba and escapes the cave. <laughs> so, yeah, and uh, basically Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan are able to team back up and they just are in sync. They're 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 going and they're able to just destroy Jemba's forces. Like they're so in sync. Klaata shows up with some blaster and like they're just it's it's really cool. They, they, they... It's, it's it, what what this reminded me of in the way that they fight together is uh, it reminded me of Last Jedi when Rey and Kylo Ren uh, fight off the guards after oh, yeah. Snoke is killed. They're That's just one insane. Of my favorite scenes. So yeah, no, it was super cool. They just it, the, the way it's described is like they just they they have a rhythm together, um, which I appreciated. Uh, you know, uh, they basically defeat the off-world guys and mm-hmm. uh, um and when the ones they didn't defeat Klata offers the kind of leftover off-world uh, worlders like a real contract because they like like the 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 whippids and some of the humans she's just like hey like you guys have been working these terrible conditions like i know we had our beef but like hey like you guys could work uh, for like a real contract <laughs> um, which I appreciate <laughs> this is the prequel stuff that I love just like talking about you know uh, contracts and trade and, uh, and fair work conditions in, indeed so I appreciate that and uh, and so Klata I mean I assume we'll deal more with her later we're coming up on the end of the book mm-hmm. here and like at the end you're like okay well Qui-Gon's finally gonna be like okay Obi-Wan you're, you're my boy let's go but no Qui-Gon's still like he's very impressed with Obi-Wan, but he's he's more he seems more concerned about himself than he is about Obi-Wan. He's, he's just like, scared. He's scared to take another Padawan. And but he he he's gonna let the boy do his job at the agricultural court, but he's gonna keep an eye on the boy. Because they're both um, gonna be on Bandamir and he's just like, okay, well, he doesn't want to be in the agricultural court. That'll be a greater challenge for him than this was. So let's see how he handles now, before... that. Now, before we wrap up, we should mention the the irony of what happens to Jemba the Hutt. So, Obi Wan, Qui Gon, and Clada are fighting everybody off, and then Jemba comes out. He's got a big old rifle, 
and you think Jemba is going to help him? No, Jemba is going to be sneaky and he's going to kill Obi-Wan and Qui-Gon when they're not looking. Meanwhile, Grilb is at the bottom of the mountain. Grilb is pissed that Qui-Gon has gotten the, the upper hand on him. He's got a rifle too. He's going to shoot Qui-Gon Jinn from the bottom of the mountain. So what's going to happen here all of a sudden? So meanwhile, a dragon comes in and bites off Jemba's tail. <laughs> and then, and then, so his tail gets bitten off, and then out of nowhere, Jemba gets shot in the chest by Grelb because Grelb's shooting sucks. I, th- I thought you were going to say that Jemba, after the tail was put on, got surgically implanted feet so that he, unlike other huts, <laughs> had feet now. And it was the worst feet, the most ironic feet for Jemba. There was a moment in the book, too, where Grobe pulled something out of his pocket, and I was like, wait a minute, is Grobe wearing clothes? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, I want some sensible fashions for the huts. I uh, know, right? <laughs> I mean, come on, they can't all just be running around naked all the time. No, I mean, at least a vest or something. Come on, they have arms. <laughs> anyway, so at the end here, yeah, like I said, Qui-Gon's going to wait out and see how Obi-Wan handles Bandamir. And they um, they land on Bandamir, finally, at the very end of the book. And in, in a section called the Afterword, which I thought was strange, it's an epilogue. Afterwords typically are like thank yous or like critical analysis, usually. But maybe mm-hmm. I'm wrong about that. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not an English major. <laughs> But anyway, so in, a, in, a, in the epilogue, basically, uh, they arrive on Bandamere, and Qui-Gon's greeted by an official who's like, oh, Qui-Gon, we have a message for you. Um, and Obi-Wan looks over his shoulder, and he sees the message, and it reads, I have been looking forward to this day. And it was signed by someone named Xanatos. So, that's the end of the book. That's the cliffhanger, and it will be continued in the book. Levi is now doing credits music. That is what Levi is doing. So, you know, that's the kind of show this will be, I suppose. Anyway, so, The Rising Force. This is also... Looking, I'm looking at my stack of other Jedi Apprentice books. This appears to be kind of the longest one. Um, yeah, they I get a little, they get about thirty or forty pages shorter, largely going forward. Um, what did you think about this book overall? I enjoyed this book. This book made me excited to read the following books. Um, there's a lot of fun stuff in this book. There's a lot of really silly stuff in this book. Uh, mainly Grilb and Jemba and the dragons, um, but I had a good time reading this. I agree. I this book. Uh, I mean, I had remembered a decent amount of it because I, I do remember reading it. And this is one of my favorite eras of Star Wars. Is kind of the immediately before Phantom Menace. I, there, as far as adult novels go, I'm a big fan of Cloak of Deception and especially of the Darth Plagueis novel by James Lucino. Those are like that's like my sweet spot as far as, like, kind of the old expanded universe goes. So I love this stuff. And um, Qui-Gon's one of my favorite characters, and I think there's a lot of great stuff with him here, and Obi-Wan's cool. I will say, it, Obi-Wan looks strange on the covers of many of these books. They clearly didn't have mm-hmm. a likeness rights for Ewan well, I think or something. To me, what they I think they did was they found a boy, like a 12-year-old boy who kind of looked like Ewan because if you look at the Jedi Quest books later on, they have Ewan on the cover. Yeah, I know. I have thinking... lot, several of those too, so it's Yeah, strange. so I'm thinking like maybe they like wanted like a young kid on the books to be Ewan, but yeah, he does look a little odd. But that's fine, whatever. As far as the book goes though, I thought it was very strong, and Dave Wolverton we joked about, you know, the wizard of storytelling and all that stuff, but it's a, it's a, it's reasonably well written. It, it, it moves, you can read it quickly. He's pretty good at writing action, which is difficult for some of these Star Wars writers, I have to say. <laughs> um, um, and, like, I can actually follow what's happening. It's not just kind of boring. Uh, but um, I, I think the characterization was largely on point. There's some goofy dialogue, a couple of goofy characters, 
but that's what you want from Star Wars in some ways too. So I, um, I thought there uh, what we read earlier, some of the Qui Gon stuff, some of the kind of uh, real J- Jedi uh, wisdom that comes out of this book. I, I found I really appreciated. So I, uh, I would, uh, I'd say it's a very strong start to the series. I'm really excited about the second book. Um, Same. Uh, so, um, so we have so what something we're gonna do is we're gonna rank all the books on a uh, on a we're gonna do a midi chlorian count for all these books how strong these books are um, I propose that uh, we're gonna figure this out as we go but I'm gonna say we should do it on a scale of ten and every number has a uh, an associated uh, character with it. So, so uh, ten, 10 would be 10 Anakin. being off the charts. Yes, A- off, off the, the charts, charts Anakin. Anakin. This book is conceived by midichlorians. That's how strong a book would be if it's a 10. And a uh, one. 9, of course. Uh, a 1 is a, what, a Bruk Chun? Bruk Chun would be a 1, you know. Just, just a little shit. Clearly not that strong with the Force. Although, who knows? We, I, maybe we'll see Bruk we'll figure Chun it again. Out. Um, but we're going to figure it out. At some point, we're going to have a list, a corresponding character to each number. But it's generally speaking a 1 through 10 scale, and you understand what that is just from, you know, life. So uh, <laughs> so how many midichlorians would you give The Rising Force? I'm going to give this book a 7, and I'm going to call a 7 a Qui-Gon Jinn. I feel like that's a bit of a shot at Qui-Gon. Uh, what? Oh, okay. I All right. Okay. Well, then, I feel like Qui Gon kind of like fathered an entire see, school of thinking about the Force. You know, about the living. Okay. Force. Then, then maybe it's an Obi Wan because, in my opinion, a nine yeah, is be. a Yoda. And I would say nine eight would be Qui Gon. Maybe I don't know. We'll talk okay. about all of this. But Seven's I actually, an Obi. Then I, I mean, I hate to be boring, but I kind of agree. A seven seems about right um, to me. So I, and, and whether that's Qui Gon or whether that's Mace Windu, although I feel like Mace has to be a bit lower, maybe. I, I think so too. I um, think Obi Wan should be seven, Qui Gon's eight, Yoda's nine, Anakin, and then uh, six we'll say is Luke, um, and then Luke, Mace though, Windu's should five. Maybe be higher. I don't know. It that's depends. So hard to say. We'll talk all well, okay, about this. Over. Let's let's say right Mace now it's seven midichlorians. Mace is middle of the field. Mace is five. All right. Uh, see, where, where would Coyote <laughs> Mundi be? That's the real question uh. we need to answer here today. <laughs> what about Plo Koon? Oh, oh. Or Yaddle? Yaddle should be two. Yaddle should be two. I think Brock Chun needs to be one. Brock Chun is, is the beginning of this podcast. He is, he is the impetus for this podcast. <laughs> Why we are doing this, it's all because of Brock Chun. So I agree. I, 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 we both agree that it's a seven midi chlorian book. We'll figure out who is seven uh, going forward. We're gonna have hopefully by the time you know we get to through five or six of these, we we have a real sense of the scale and who's on the scale. Um, but seven, it, 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 I, that's surprising. We agree pretty thoroughly on this book. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, I worry in some ways that we are gonna agree most of the time. But uh, I hope you enjoyed this. We've got a couple more things related to the Rising Force. We have a segment that we have yet to name. Uh, see, whenever anybody writes Yoda dialogue, uh, including George Lucas, sometimes they get too caught up in the crazy syntax and stuff starts to make little sense. We already made fun of some Yoda stuff earlier with that exchange between Bant and Obi-Wan, but Anytime it's applicable, if Yoda's in this in a book, we're going to try to find the goofiest Yoda dialogue in a segment that we will name later. So this week, Levi uh, has chosen a line of dialogue from the Rising Force. Take it away. Begun. The Clone War has. Yes. This is on page five. In this scene, we have uh, Bruck and Obi-Wan are training before Yoda. Uh, sabers clashing. Um, <laughs> so here, I'm going to read this passage, and it'll end with the, with the Yoda quote. Come on, Ophi, Brock, uh, Bruck taunted. See if you can hit me again one last time before they throw you out of the temple. Bruck, enough, Yoda said. 
learn to lose as well as win. A Jedi must. Go to your room, you will. <laughs> I love him saying, like, uh, very mundane orders in the Yoda. Yes, go, go, go to, to your, your room, room, you, you will. will. Go to your room, you will. It's very goofy. <laughs> I I don't know. I think there's uh, there's a lot there. Um, I Yoda, you know, when it works, it really works. When it doesn't, you get stuff like go to your room. Go to your room, you, you will. will. It's like just go to your room works. Uh, he, you know, he speaks in normal syntax sometimes, but, uh, anyway, uh, another segment we're going to try to include in most episodes is, uh, a Wikipedia deep dive. We're going to, uh, take too many Wookiees from the Wikipedia jar, if you know what I mean. <laughs> So you, you got something um, for this? <laughs> I I looked up the thing we were kind of chuckling about earlier: dragons or dragons. Um, mm-hmm. the, the the main reason I think this is funny is that I love when Star Wars is too hesitant to use like an obvious thing that everybody uses. Like so, like they'll like come up with something just off. Like they can't say steel; they got to say transparent steel. I can't say. <laughs> yes. Like, I think that's so Dura funny. Durasteel. And this, yeah, Durasteel. I think it's hilarious that uh, they can't, these are dragons. Look on Wikipedia. They just look like dragons, basically. They're flying, winged creatures. They don't breathe fire, but they look like dragons. And they, yes, they can't bring themselves to use the word dragon. And, and maybe that's good, because I'm sure there would be a ton of dorks that are mad that, like, Someone drank hot coffee in Heir to the Empire. Not hot coffee. They drank a hot chocolate in Heir to the Empire, and that's like breaks the universe in their mind or something. <laughs> but, uh, um, <laughs> so, but anyway, so I looked up dragons, and I'm going to read here the first paragraph. The rest of it is largely just summarizing this book. So, uh, but dragons. But this is the only appearance. Uh, only this appearance is their only appearance. They're mentioned in the next book. Uh, the dark rival, but unfortunately they never appear again, and they um, they don't appear in anything else. But this, I love Wikipedia and and Wikipedia stuff in general. The way they write about stuff makes me laugh. So, dragons were an avian species native to an unknown watery planet between Bandamere and Coruscant. They ate fish from the oceans of their world, although this did not make up their diet entirely. Dragons were covered in silver scales and had strong legs and large, single-clawed wings, along with yellow eyes and dagger-like teeth. Dragons were said to resemble flying Ithorian razor sharks. (laughs) Another thing they might have resembled is dragons. (laughs) But but anyway, I I don't know. I, I, I hope to... Wikipedia is an insane website. There are like I know there are and, and, entries for like cup, like a cup, like explaining what it is in the Star Wars universe. What? A speeder. Speeder. Like all I'm talking about a like cup. mundane objects that everybody knows what they are, but they then list the appearances of like water <laughs> or like I, I mean I don't know about water, but <laughs> a well, lot of stuff. It, now that be, that being said. Salt has its own article on Wikipedia uh, because, as mentioned in this book, Arconians uh, do not do well with salt. Now, this book makes it out to be that if an Arconian ingests salt, it's poison. However, in other Star Wars median, mediums, salt is a hallucinogen yes. to Arconians and that it is highly addictive to Arconians. And of course, Hem Dazon in the Cantina is a salt addict. Well, there you and go. And this is a quote from the Arconian page on Wikipedia. It's a story, <laughs> a little anecdote. An Arconian was seen in a dive bar consuming a soup 
in which he had poured an entire salt shaker's worth of salt and then was observed stumbling out of the cantina like it was last call. Wow. <laughs> that the source the source of that is only Star Wars the Old Republic. So I don't know if this takes place in a video game that at some point you can observe an Arconian dumping salt in soup and then stumbling out like a druggie. Um, but uh, that was the silly thing that I found on Wikipedia. All right, one and last... Something... Oh, no. Go ahead. One last bit well, about... I'm gonna... Okay, I'm just going to say this real quick. The Wikipedia page for this book, The Rising Force needs a little help because in the plot summary there are five paragraphs six total six total paragraphs five paragraphs discuss the opening of this book in the jedi temple the final paragraph discusses the rest of the events of the book which is a hundred plus pages versus exactly like 25 so that's very goofy uh, Wikipedia editors, get your shit together. <laughs> <laughs> what are you trying to push on us? <laughs> so I've uh, I've got one more dragon thing. <laughs> <laughs> I found a fanfic on fanfiction.net entitled "Avoiding the Dragon" by Darth <laughs> Ken Obi Wan. It's from 2008. <laughs> And it's about five paragraphs. Would you like to hear this story? I want to hear the whole thing. All right. It's called Avoiding the Dragon. He creeped through the archives, overdue hollow novels in hand. Hopefully the dragon would be out hunting and not waiting in her den. There was absolute silence in this place. Not a soul wanted to attract the attention of the dragon. Moving through the shelves, he reached out with the force, hoping not to sense her nearby. Oh, no! There she was, just two rows from his current position. He ran up the rest of the row he was in and across the intersecting aisle. Moving quickly up the row, he reached and he reached the end and turned left into another aisle, then left then left again two rows later. <laughs> he reached out through the force again. She was headed back to her den. There was no way he'd be able to get there and return the hollows. He decided to wait her out. If he remembered correctly, she'd go for another prowl in about 15 minutes. Then he'd get his chance. In the meantime, he needed something to do. Glancing around at the hollows on the shelves, he decided to look for one on avoiding dragons. While using the force to keep tabs on her position, he froze. She had moved and was, once again, on the prowl. She was headed away from his position. Thank the force! He moved quickly to her den and placed the hollows on her desk. He was just meters from freedom when... Master Kenobi, do you need assistance? He swallowed his fear and turned to come to face with the face to face with the dragon. Uh, no, thank you, Master New. I was just, uh, returning some of, uh, Anakin's overdue hollows. At the pre... <laughs> At the predatorial look that came over her face, he added quickly... But don't worry, I've spoken to him, and it won't happen again. See that it does not, Master Kenobi. Recognizing the dismissal, he made good his escape. Saved by his own Padawan's bad habits. But Anakin didn't need to know that. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> that was brilliant. Darth Ken Obi-Wan, a true legend. All right, so... <laughs> Moving on, uh, we're going to look forward to the second book in the Jedi Apprentice series, The Dark Rival by Jude Watson. This is what we'll be covering next week. I'm looking at the cover now as we speak. What do you think that what do you think this hold what what treasures do you believe this holds for us? All right, we see uh, Qui-Gon Jinn crossing lightsabers with a figure cloaked in black. He has a very pale white face and he has a red lightsaber. I am assuming that this is his former Padawan, Xanatos. Um, and behind it could be them, the guy behind him. That's true, because behind them, there's a large head 
and the head has dark hair. It appears to be a male face, and there's a scar on a cheek. And if we know anything, scars indicate dark side. Um, and then, so uh, we, I'm assuming we are going to see a lightsaber battle in this and a dark rival. Yes, so uh, this will be the book we discuss next week. Um, I am very excited for it. Uh, So generally speaking, we're going to try to mix things up, but we're going to try to keep making progress in whatever series we're in the middle of. So we're going to try to do two or three in a row and then take a break and do like a one-off book and then go back. So... Um, if, if you're if you're trying to read along, the next book we're reading is The Dark Rival. These books are out of print, so you kind of have to find them on the secondary market, but they're not that expensive. So hopefully no, you can I, do that, and hopefully we describe the plot well enough. I got them the for about well three enough. bucks a piece. Yeah, hopefully we describe the plot well enough that even if you're not reading along, you can enjoy the podcast. Um, so join our book club. Join the Younglings. book club here at the Join Padawan the book Library. club, Younglings. Uh, younglings, yes. Younglings. Uh, anyway, join the book club, Younglings. You will. Oh boy, <laughs> I don't know about that. Um, I'm 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 also hoping in these books we are three weeks out of Obi Wan's birthday. I'm really hoping at some point in this series we get to celebrate Obi Wan's birthday. Ooh, that'd be a lot of fun. I I don't know how long they take place over. I don't know if they lead right into Phantom Menace or if it's. So we'll see. Um. Anyway, so the, our last segment, uh, we don't have a name for this yet. we got to come up with something, but we're going to do a mailbag segment. we, we got to come up with something Star Wars-y. Uh, we'll figure it out. Uh, but you might think, it's our first episode. How do we have mail? And it's like, well, we have friends who some of them will be future <laughs> guests on this podcast. And uh, uh, so we got them to ask us some general Star Wars questions. And I got uh, my brother and future guests on this podcast – Dan May, uh, he asked us three questions. So, Ooh. first, what is your dream Star Wars novel that has yet to be written? Ooh, that's a really good question. Um, I'm going to just, this is the first thing that pops into my head. I want a novel that bridges the gap between episode one and episode two, and it tells us what happens to Watto after the pod race. <laughs> I like that idea. Um, I, I'm i going to go slightly more serious. I'd actually want to go even before what we're reading now. Like, uh, And I want the book about Dooku and Qui-Gon. The fact that this Ooh. has not been written is insane to me. Um, and I think the obvious writer would be like James Lucino or someone. But honestly, anybody I would like to see write this story. It seems crazy to me that no one's ever touched it. Um, it uh, it's been how long since Attack of the Clones? Uh, I know. 17 years? Come on, guys. Uh, let's go. Uh, hopefully, for the maybe for the 20th anniversary of Attack of the Clones, they'll do that. Um, we got some Phantom Menace-related novels coming out this year, so we'll see. Um Anyway, so the second question he asks, what annoys you most about the Star Wars fan base? <laughs> we, we don't have all day, so let's keep it brief. Let's pick one thing. Oh, um, you go first while I think about this. All right, well, I do find prequel haters annoying, but I'll, I'll, I'll actually just say I find a lot of Star Wars fans don't seem and this is very generalized and i don't i don't mean everyone star wars is the most popular thing in the world so obviously lots of smart people but i just think a lot of star wars fans do not really view them as movies they don't think of them as cinema and they just think of them as kind of a lifestyle and so like they that whenever you try to talk to them about the kind of filmmaking behind star wars i find it's a it's it's frustrating because they often even if they're not being dismissive they can be kind of they 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 don't care and that bums me out because i Mm -hmm. think i think star wars at its best is great filmmaking and when i try to explain why i don't like some of the newer movies a lot of it is just that i don't think the filmmaking is as strong although there's exceptions to that i love the last jedi as you know so um um this is something that um it's not really a problem anymore because these people were all proved wrong um, but leading up to Force Awakens, there were 
um, rumors uh, that uh, fans were speculating that Luke Skywalker had turned to the dark side. Yes. And if you believe this, you have the most inaccurate understanding of of these movies. Luke Skywalker sang to the Emperor, Sheev Palpatine, easily I the most one of the most evil and despicable people in the Star Wars universe. I am a Jedi like my father before me. That right there says that Luke will never turn. I deleted friends from Facebook. <laughs> I I I because they weren't friends anymore. If you believe that you weren't my friend anymore. Uh, if you're not with me, then you're my enemy. <laughs> um. I I have to say that I, I uh, that actually ties in with what really the biggest the big one is that people who love Star Wars, but the reason they love Star Wars is like the Sith. I find very confounding, like that. There's like, oh, like, I hate the Jedi. The Jedi, like. Obviously, the prequels are about the fall, the downfall of the Jedi, and and like what what led to that. But this idea that the Sith are like actually right is one of the dumbest things ever. I like, know they're a bunch of Ayn Rand reading like you know imbeciles. I whatever. I don't. I don't. <laughs> uh, this is hilarious. The last question. Uh, this actually ties into something you said earlier. He said, <laughs> "Who should write the Watto novel?" <laughs> I can't believe it. He sent these questions all before we started recording. So it's very funny that you asked that. Um, we should, obviously. I think we should fill that gap in. I'll be, uh, <laughs> I agree. But to give a serious answer, I guess, based on who, people who have written Star Wars books, I don't know, because Watto... A lot of my favorite Star Wars writers, I don't really see being that interested in Wada. Your James Lucinos, your uh, your Michael Stackpoles, your Claudia Grays. It's, it's from all different eras of Star Wars writing. But um, I will say this: uh, I typically find beastie writing in Star Wars, but the least appealing writing about beasties, if you know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I, uh, I, I think it can just be really boring. Like your Alan Dean Fosters, you know, just writing endlessly about the little beasties that, uh, uh, instead of writing about characters, it's very endless explanations of how it, how he's dripping everywhere. I don't need to hear about it. But because Watto's kind of a beastie, um, one guy who writes that stuff pretty well, and I mean he's dead unfortunately, uh, but uh, Brian Daly who wrote the. Uh, Han Solo Adventures. I think I want him to write uh, about uh, Watto's story. Or, actually, you know what? Forget Brian Daly. The, the R.I.P. But <laughs> the the person <laughs> I want to write this is uh, 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 the, the writer John Jackson Miller. He wrote a book called Kenobi that came out right at the end of uh, the, right before the kind of reboot of the books. Uh, it's one of the last Legends novels, and it's about Obi-Wan on Tatooine, um, and uh, it's just great. It's like a Western, so he has a real sense of Tatooine, so I think you need that that setting uh, if you're going to write about Watto. So I'll say John Jackson Miller. Um, anyway, so... I can't so, believe that question. That's so... <laughs> I can't believe it tied in so perfectly, so... Uh, I want to thank everyone for listening to the first episode of Padawan Library. Uh, you guys can contact us at padawanlibrary at gmail.com. Uh, send us your questions. Send us your questions. Comments, we want to answer concerns. questions from people that aren't going to be guests on the podcast. Uh, it would be nice. Uh, we also have a Facebook page, Padawan Library. We have And an Instagram, Instagram padawanlibrary.com slash padawanlibrary. Um, dot com whatever you know what i mean i don't understand these technology things and we have a twitter at padawan library so please check out all of uh, us on there we're going to share kind of pictures from wikipedia some of the illustrations there's a hilarious picture of ruck chun that must be shared with all um <laughs> and uh and we're going to try to come up with some fun stuff you know hopefully if enough people especially on like the facebook and stuff if they like uh the face it, it, maybe we can start kind of a real community there we'll see what happens um but anyway i hope you guys join us next week for the dark rival um and uh may the force be with you may the force be with you padawan library is hosted and produced by tim may and levi Paratic. 
It is edited by Tim May. Our theme song is by The Astral Project. Our artwork is by Freddie Funbuns. Padawan Library is copyright 2019 by Tim May and Levi Paratic. All rights reserved. <laughs>